Hello and welcome to Two Beers Till Takeoff, the podcast inspired by conversations overheard at the airport bar. Join Phil as he grabs a couple of beers and chats with interesting people from around the world, sharing expert knowledge and hilarious stories that you won't find in your guidebook. So pull up a stool and get ready for an adventure as we explore worlds of travel and beyond with Two Beers Till Takeoff. Four hours in a Taliban headquarters. I had dog meat in Laos. With a golden retriever. Smack a dirty old smooch <laughs> on our beautiful fish right here. He didn't die, but he fell down the side of the mountain. Hello and welcome to Two Beers Still Takeoff. My name is Phil and today we have a world traveler and YouTuber on to tell some wild stories. This man has been to over 100 countries and has had the chance to visit ones like Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia and South Sudan. Welcome to the show, Chris Must List. Yeah, it's an honor. I I, I appreciate that. And if you say uh, Iraq um, in in I in Iraq, you're going to get in quite a bit of trouble. <laughs> I, I did the same, but uh, thank you for the warm welcoming. What's going on, man? Listen, I've been following along uh, on YouTube, but I'm sure that there's some people that haven't you know had the chance to to know your content. So maybe update yeah. people where you've just kind of come back from. Yeah, for sure. Like I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with this thing called YouTube, uh, and possibly more obsessed with traveling. Um, I don't know if it's a midlife crisis. I just feel like my time is somewhat limited, uh, and, and I'm on a mission to see every country in the world. So I, I am practically nonstop. So a couple of days ago, I go, I got home from a ten thousand mile drive, solo drive, I'm big, basically a big circle around the United States of America. Um, you know. There are so many stories. There are so many unique people to interact with and meet. And uh, it's like a never ending journey. Uh, um, Prior to that, my last, I guess, big country was South Sudan uh, in Kenya. Mm. Uh, But I mean, every three weeks, I'm somewhere. So over the course of the year, I try my best to do 20 new countries. Um, So I'm always, yeah, I'm always somewhere, somewhere different. And and I never really pre pre plan. I, I normally give myself about a week notice. Maybe I dreamed about, dreamt about something or some something on Insta, Instagram inspired me. Um, yeah, basically that's me, me all over the world. Nice. So there's a lot of spontaneity going into picking 100%. destinations. A hundred percent. You know, as the list gets lower, like how many countries I haven't seen, um, I, I have a pretty good grasp of which countries I sort of want to see sooner than later. Uh, but I mean, that always changes. Nice. And and so Chris, uh I must ask, Chris must list, what's the story behind the name? Yeah, it's like a new modern, my own version of a bucket list. Just a list of things uh I want to do. I'm very physical, so my whole life uh, when I want to complete something, I, I write a list. So I have books mm. and notepads everywhere of things like to accomplish. So uh it, it's my travel list, my must list, my must see list before I uh leave planet Earth. Sweet. Well, you know what? I want to play a bit of a game. Little play on words here, but I'm wondering if you, Chris, could list some things for me. So, Chris, if you must list these three countries in terms of places you'd move, how would you rank them? Pakistan, Jamaica, Japan. Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica, number one. Japan, number two. Uh, Pakistan, number three. Although I would say Pakistan has the nicest people out of those three. Uh, it's oh, really? too distinctively different from uh, the way I grew up. Um, and, and Jamaica, number one, because the people are incredible, the culture. Uh, and it's like a two and a half hour short flight away from home, my home here in Toronto. Um, so, yeah, Jamaica would be number one for sure. Nice. So, Chris, if you must list these in terms of places you places you would prioritize vacationing with your family how would you rank them thailand honduras brazil my wife is asian um she was born in the philippines but she came to canada when she was one years old and never never returned to the philippines or asia since so my kids are half asian so i would go with thailand would be number one um and then brazil i was in honduras recently in the last six months, it's not nearly as dangerous, I guess, as it once was. You know, it was always ranked as like number one for murder rate. I met some great people there and I saw some beautiful scenery, but 
there's so many wonderful places in the world I would go with my family prior to that. And Brazil is one of my ultimate favorite countries in the world. So that would easily come. In. Brazil's awesome. J just on the subject, though, where, where, where did you get a chance to go? Yeah, I can see you have some dots on the back there, uh, right, right behind your ears. Uh, I still got to I want to go to the Amazon um, in, in Brazil. That's my, I guess, my next trip. But I've been to Rio mm -hmm. twice, and both times I spent about three weeks there. So that quite a bit of time. Um, that's my my favorite part of Brazil that I've seen thus far. But there's Bahia. Oh, have you been to Bahia? I have, yeah. Yeah. So I heard that I heard yeah. a lot of good, uh, good like uh, culture um and dancing and music there so i can't wait to go there and do that amazon uh trip hey 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 you come here i got a secret for you this episode is sponsored by no days wasted a leader in the hangover supplement this episode is sponsored by no days wasted a leader in the sump <laughs> this episode is sponsored by no days wasted a leader in the hangover supplement industry Listeners can now get 15% off their next purchase by using promo code two beers in all caps at checkout. Yeah. Yeah. Bahia is great for like that Afro, uh, yeah. Afro kind of culture up there. It's, uh, it's very colorful uh, architecture. You don't really expect that. You see that there, it's very colonial, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really beautiful place. Uh, um, yeah. there's one place though in, in Brazil that I must say is very, near and dear to my heart is a place called Belo Horizonte. Reason being has the most bars per capita in the world. Okay. So that, there's that, nothing there. That's a, that's a, there's nothing there, but bars. There's, there's nothing there, but bars. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, now I know what motivates you with traveling. I, I, I try to stay as far as far away from bars as I can. Um, well, nowadays, you're still taking off. Nowadays that I'm holding a camera, I, I don't want to embarrass myself too much uh, on camera. <laughs> but that's a pretty good question. That that's neat. You got my mind, the gears in my brain ticking, thinking uh, what I would do. So, Chris, I've got two more for you. Sure. So, if you must list these countries in terms of places you witness the most amazing wildlife, how would you rank them? Nepal, Somalia, Kenya. Oh. Well, Kenya, I've seen the most wildlife, but it's like a gated, it's almost like a, a, a big open air zoo, uh, which I don't dislike. Um, so Kenya, Kenya for sure, Masai Mara. Overall, like from an adventure standpoint, Nepal, although I didn't see that much wildlife, I know it's there. And it, and it felt like the animals were free, like they weren't within a park. They were just everywhere. Um, in, in Somalia, I didn't see any animals like Somali land. I got to go to a cheetah rescue, uh, where they had like a few hundred cheetahs that were rescued from people's homes, uh, which was very unique and, and incredible. But those are the only animals that I saw when I was in Somalia slash Somali land. Okay, nice. So Chris, last one, if you must list these three brands, starting with your favorite, how would you rank Dolce & Gabbana, Gucci, not your average tourist merch? Yeah, I'd have to go with not your average. <laughs> no, really and truly, really, uh, YouTube is relatively new to me. Um, yeah, I've been doing YouTube travel channel for three years. My first video was uploaded three years ago. Maybe a year and a half ago, I started taking this seriously. Uh, my whole Hi. life, I'm 45 years old. My whole life, I've been into sunglasses and shoes. Um, so I've, I've always, it's always been my brand. I'm a branding guy. Big glasses, uh, flamboyant glasses. Have always been my thing, uh, and most of those glasses are Gucci. Um, nice. Look, I'm wearing a hoodie from Walmart and a tank top from Walmart, so it's not that I'm um, into material things too much. Uh, but I mean, my I probably have a hundred pair of Gucci glasses easily. Uh, I, I don't like to bring the good ones out on vacation because I know they're going to get messed up. So I I sort of yeah. keep the rotation fairly small. Uh, but as I continue to like the merch, for me is is something that's I haven't even really touched base with it yet. Uh, it's really just starting now as I start to grow. So that has to become my favorite or there's something wrong with me in the very near future. <laughs> but I've never worn yeah, uh, Dolce and Gabbana. I don't think I've worn that in my life. So that would come in last hey, place. No, listen, you, get, you got to rep the brand, right? But yeah. so, yes, yeah, so you just mentioned that you've, you've been doing it for three years. So 
did you start traveling three years ago or did you, did no. you only just start vlogging three years ago? I've been traveling my whole life. Uh, the thought of holding a camera up in front of my face was actually daunting. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, I know people say this. I'm a shy person by nature. Uh, like, I mean, if we were in a room uh, and like it's happened before and, and I'm in a business, a room where you're supposed to like network with other people and shake hands and, Hey, what do you do? And all that kind of stuff. I'm horrible at that. I don't what there's a name for it. But just like mingling, I guess. Introvert? Not, yeah, I'm introvert. Yeah. But I mean, the lack of, I'm not motivated to mingle. Okay. Like even young growing up, I would never go up to a girl and say like, you want to dance or anything like that. It's just not me. I'm very shy. Cool. So the thought of me holding a camera up uh, and walking around like this, uh, talking, it wasn't a pleasant thought. Uh, and it took me a lot of practice to to actually be able to hold the camera up. I'm like, I'm uncomfortably, uh, how do I put it, shy when it comes to holding a camera to my face. Uh, but I lucked out a little bit. My like third or fourth video in Brazil on Copacabana Beach, just walking on the beach, hit a million views in like one week. And it opened yeah. my eyes up to the opportunity. I wasn't even monetized at the time. And it wasn't the kind of content I like. So when I hit a million, I actually took the video down. Uh, because I didn't want, I was getting comments like all pertaining to the girls and the, what they're wearing and the men. Yeah. It was a very sexualized thing. And I'm like, this is not why I'm doing this. But, but I guess to get into to it deeper, I've been traveling my whole life. Like since I was 16, I was saving money to drive to Florida, uh, you know, either by myself or with friends. Um, so I, I visited over a hundred countries easy before I started a YouTube channel. It, it was like the encouragement of my family saying like, Chris, you're doing all this crazy stuff. Like, why don't you just record it? And it was never about money yeah. for YouTube. It was like, let me, you know, let me archive some of the crazy stuff I'm seeing. Yes. Yeah, so, so maybe what was the, the motivation to kind of start though? You know what I mean? You started at 16. Yeah. What was the first, was it an inspiration from like a family member or like, did you just always want to do it? No, no, I don't know what it is. I was just born with it. I, I, I was never good at like reading or learning. I'm horrible in school. Um, had no interest in school, um, but you know, like reading a, one of those yellow National Geographic magazines from the the thrift shop or the thrift shop yeah, or antique yeah. store, like that. That is something I always got excited by, it, and because I'm not a great reader, like I don't, I don't retain. If I read a novel, I might retain ten percent of what has happened, and I forgot about the rest. So when I see like a tribe in National Geographic, I want to get out there and meet them. I want to shake mm. hands. I want to taste the food they're cooking. That's how I learn best. Um, so I've always been addicted to that. So any little, even when I had no money, any money I had, I, I would do like the, you know, like the dieting, eating, you know, chicken noodle soup uh, for a month or two in order to be able to go to Mexico or go to Dominican Republic or go to Jamaica, even at, at 18 years old, right? So this has been an addiction my whole life. And once you've gone to Jamaica a bunch of times and Dominican Republic and Mexico and Florida, you know, most, most human beings like myself think of like, what more can I do? What's something more adventurous? And, and don't get me wrong. It is exciting when I'm at a, at a party and somebody says, you know, Chris has been to Afghanistan and everybody like all the attention circles around me. I'm like, yeah, I've been to Afghanistan. Uh, so like, it's a different thanks for your like, service. Yeah, no, not, not my <laughs> service. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's addicting to like to be the only one in the room that has done something. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm I'm addicted, man. I I can't stop. I can't. I don't stop thinking about it. It is it is always and forever. Well, yeah, shit. Based on the amount of content you put out, I I can hundred percent attest to that. That you're 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 constantly yeah. thinking about it. But for you, let's let's try to go a bit deeper here. When you're going to see, you know what I mean? You see that National Geographic. Uh, magazine you see that tribe you say like oh my god i want to go meet them for you what is the thing that you want to go meet is it that you want to discover their culture is it you want to get that yeah. culture shock like what what is what are you looking for into traveling yeah education uh which which normally means culture um now nowadays there's no culture shock like it's very difficult to shock me i've seen everything so many times uh but it's not just culture like i've been i went to a war in ukraine when it happened mm -hmm. i went to the front lines um and it's not because I like war, because it's the opposite. I don't like guns. I don't dislike guns, but I don't like guns. I don't have a gun. Um, it, so I'm like I'm a collector. 
a collector of things. My whole life I've been a collector of things, physical things. This is like a collection of places I've been. I don't know what it is. It's just like I've been to war. I've been to this. I've been to that. I've been. To, it's a collection of memories that motivates me because not everything is cultural. Some are, are just historic moments in time that I want to be a participant in, or at least I want to be a witness to. Um, so that keeps me moving. And, and you know, and, it never ends because tomorrow something could happen. I saw today a, a, a bridge collapsed in the yeah, U.S. That's like if I crazy. wasn't doing what I was doing, I would have jumped down there because it's like it, it might be a small. Um, I'm sorry, I don't even know if people lost their life. I'm presuming they did. Forgive me. Yeah, probably. Um, but it's something I would normally go to to document just as being like taking a piece of history. Um, so my motivation is is collecting memories, really. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild what happened there, man. Like, I I didn't really see too much about it, but I've heard just looking at you know news articles, kind of went through some of the comments. Some people claim that there was a cyber attack. I was like, yikes! Yeah, with, that's uh, with the internet. You got to be careful because they yeah they a lot of stuff. But yeah, I mean, listen, it's 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 really terrible what happened. Obviously, there's I think yeah. people that did lose their lives, but it's that boat definitely did hit the best part if you want to put that bridge down, right? Which is kind of right. weird, right, right, right. For 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 a boat that lost power. But anyways, uh, Chris, you know, in your videos, you do go to areas typically not frequented by tourists. Uh, you have videos like we were just talking about, you know, videos with tribes in Africa and war zones and in the hood and what really motivates you to go to those specific dangerous areas of the world yeah i don't know i don't like from a from a business standpoint from a youtube standpoint uh you know when i decided to start carrying this little camera around and facing it towards me uh i decided that i want to be the best i can at it okay i'm not going to do this to half-ass it like like anything in my life when i want something i, I become hyper obsessed um, so I, I took it as a business. So I sat down on a table, literally with a pen, a pen and paper, and I wrote down, like, what can I bring to the table that others will not? Like, what what special traits do I have or gifts? And one of the things I wrote down is that I have I, I don't have fear. Okay. Okay. Let me correct myself. I definitely have fear for certain things, but people in neighborhoods and gangs and slums, don't I don't have fear for. People don't scare me. Um so that was one of the things that made me different. Uh, another thing that I wrote down is, look, I'm not coming in trying to make a career immediately. I have money. Um, you know, I want to do this for fun, but I also have the money that I can invest to go to these places where somebody starting out won't have the money to go apply for a $1,000 visa in South Sudan, for example. Um, and thirdly, I have the support of my family. Uh, my wife is like in incredibly supportive um, as I am to her career. Uh, and those three things I think are what makes me different. Throw in some crazy sunglasses or, or nerd glasses uh, now and then. And that's sort of my brand. And that's the reason I go to places that others don't. But what I'm seeing is that's changing a lot of people. Cause, like, for example, when I was in Kenya and I, and I fil filmed the worst slums, Kibera slums, I can't tell you how many Kenyans told me, well, you went, now I'm going. And I see like tons of videos there. Um, so maybe I'm opening the door to other people, uh, but in reality, I just like I like the danger factor of um, visiting certain places that other people might not. Right, and you know, we, I think we will get into some of the the locations a bit more, some of the more specific locations uh, when we're talking when, when you're doing your story. But there's a group of people that you met once that were very, I guess, considered dangerous, the Agori people in India. So you spend yeah. some time with them, and they're famously this spiritual group who do not kill people, but they are cannibals. So can you tell me about that experience? Man, what an incredible experience. Um, I knew nothing about the Agori before I went to India. Like, I've seen stories on them, but I didn't do any research. I knew nothing. They're wild. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> so the first moment I got to meet um, a gentleman, and I'm like, can you introduce me to the Agori? And I had a conversation with, through the translator. I'm like, wow. I became addicted immediately. Like I want to find out more and more and more. Uh, and that's the kind of people that you need to return a couple of times in order to really, really, really get the good gist of uh, what they're all about. 
But I mean, on my final night in uh, Varanasi, India, I was sitting with the Agori and I drank the alcohol out of the, the human skull. I didn't, I didn't highlight it too much in the video. It is in my video because I was worried it was going to get blocked or I would have yeah, liked yeah, yeah. it on my thumbnail and put title. But it happened. I don't even think most people realize it happened because I sort of tried to keep it away. But so I'm so intrigued. Varanasi in India and the culture. And then you add the Agori. Man, even talking about it right now, my hands are getting all sweaty in excitement because there's so much to learn with with, with them. And, and yeah, I heard the same thing that some of them are cannibals. Um, I didn't witness any of that. So uh, I, I can only speak about what I what I personally saw. It's a very <laughs> yeah, spiritual dude. Yeah, man, I remember the first time I came across them uh, was on, I don't know if you remember the TV show Wild Boys, Steve-O, yes. yeah. Chris Pontius. And I remember they went to go to meet the Agori in India. And dude, I think he had a cut or something on his foot and the guy started sucking his toe, like sucking the blood. I was like, like, what, what is happening, dude? Like, who are these people? I have a quick Agori story. So I'm in this little room with him. Uh, and there's a younger man from Los Angeles in the room as well uh, that that's there to learn how to, um, oh my goodness, what is it? Like when you're sitting in your, uh, learning how to get into a deeper med meditative state, um, they they like, live with like next to nothing. Uh, money is not mandatory, so they don't ask me for money. So I bring gifts. So I brought a, a bag of rice amongst other things. Like the, they only survive off the staples in life. They don't, they don't overdo it, right? So. I'm sitting there for hours and we're talking within this little indoor outdoor room. There's no windows or anything. Uh, and I see a mouse is, is gnawing into the rice that I got like the top corner. So I'm like, Hey, the mouse there and they're laughing. They just start laughing. I said, okay. So then I see the mouse go in and he's coming out little tiny mouse sticking his head out. Right. Uh, and I'm like, guys, I don't know if it's going to like, contaminate your rice. I don't know how it works. I'm like, just the mouse. And he laughed. He said, Chris, leave the mouse. There's enough food for the three of us. It's like him, the guy. In the... So even though in his life, in his world, he had one rice, maybe like one little loaf of bread, and one thing for, for him, and, and no ownership, no bank account, no money in the bank, no storage of food. Even though he was on very small rations of food, he was willing to share with a mouse. And I thought, I don't know if it was just me, like, I don't know if it's a metaphorical thing or something. I thought it was an incredible learning experience. I'm like, man, you know, most people, when they have little, they want to, they want to keep it. Uh, no, maybe, yeah. maybe it's not when they have little. It's like when they have a lot, they want to keep it. And I don't even just mean money. I just mean things in general. Oh, no, 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 that's mine. That's I want more. I want more. I want more. Uh, when this man was willing to share his only rice with a little rodent, um, yeah, it's a memory I'll, I'll remember. One day I told myself I was going to get a tattoo on my body of the little mouse as uh, sort of like a a memory of, of that day. That's, that's a pretty cool story, man. Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm looking forward one day to uh, to definitely go check them out and uh, hopefully not get eaten. No, you're good. You're safe. I don't know if you can wear those glasses there. If you wear those glasses, there could be there could be trouble. Dude, what do you mean? You sent me these to wear them for the episode. What are you talking about? I can't. I can't claim any. I can't claim any part of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about another part of the world that you've been. Uh, I want to talk about if you can compare contrast your experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. So Iraq, incredible people. Afghanistan, incredible people. Both have very good food. Um, if I were to compare the two, both incredible. I don't know. I don't know. But, and also both countries that were like uh, destroyed uh, to a certain extent by the U.S. Army. Um, some people will say for reasons. Others will say not. I would say that, no, we didn't need. I say we. I'm, I'm Canadian. We as humans didn't need to go into Af Afghanistan or Iraq. A lot of people would say since Saddam Hussein is gone, uh, that the country has really fallen uh, into poverty, into troubles. I'm the kind of guy that I think you stick your 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 head only when you're invited. Um, going back, both countries incredible. They they 
by far past my expectations. Both countries I want to return to. Uh, the one the one problem with Afghanistan is it's like a new country. It's very similar to to South Sudan, where South Sudan is a new country. I mean, the leadership of Afghanistan is so new; it's so unorganized. The Taliban are not they're not taught in school how to use a computer. Everything is very old school and we're, we live in a new world. So, I yeah. mean, the trouble of a tourist like myself going there and, and waiting four days to apply for a permission or a permit to video, getting that granted, but yet every single day I'm there, I'm arrested. And, and I don't mean arrested like with handcuffs, but I'm definitely detained and brought into police stations to verify my documents because everything is like on paper. So if that happens at seven at night, you will spend the night at the police station until the next morning, uh, until they can get a hold of someone. So That's that cool. aspect of the travel is not fun. It is, it out of any country I've been to, it's the most stressful. Not not because of danger, but because of just being seen by Taliban, and you know, consistently just every day being held for maybe four or five, six hours in, in detainment. You never know. One day they could say that, hey, we're going to keep you for the next 10 years. So it's 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 very weighing on your mind. Whereas Iraq, you can travel freely. Uh, but again, both countries, incredible. I don't think people realize how nice people of like Afghanis are or Iraqis are, but they're, they're very like nice natured. They'll invite you in as a stranger to their house, which happened to me. Uh, there and they they want to cook for you and everything. There's just just incredible. I, I I can't speak highly enough about them. Nice. Any any stories from those from those areas? Well, Afghanistan, you know, Taliban. So even from the moment I crossed from Pakistan manually in a car, uh, I drove to Kabul. Uh, in Afghanistan, Taliban is, is the ruling government. They stop us everywhere, like me, the taxi driver everywhere. They see me and they can tell I'm a tourist right away. So at first they wanted pictures and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world because I'm thinking I'm going to send these home to my friends and be like, look, I got pictures with Taliban. Uh, but then I also came to the understanding of people sending me messages on Instagram saying like, you know, Taliban killed my family eight years ago. Um, and I'm like, wow, right? I got to be open-minded yeah. and look at both sides of this. It's pretty cool to take a picture uh, with Taliban, but to stay open-minded that I'm, I'm not a supporter um, of anybody being killed. So it was, it was, it was the first time out of any of my travels where I had to really think about what I posted, uh, knowing that it's very similar to North Korea, that if I posted something negative against Taliban, I would never be allowed back into the country. And there was right. definitely negative stuff I could post, but I like Afghanistan so much and I want to go deeper that I have to hold those, stories inside my brain until the last yeah. time I visit. And it's the same in Syria uh, with their government. You cannot say negative things. It's not free speech. Um, so it was an eye-opener uh, in, in in Afghanistan. Definitely different. And everybody that I know that's been there has said the same thing. It's a very stressful uh, trip. Yeah, I think uh, the, the reason I, I guess I asked is because we had our mutual friend, uh, Nolan, your boy Seal, he yeah. he came on to tell a story of uh, his experience in Iraq. Okay, I didn't even know he went to Iraq. Yeah, dude. He. Uh, anyways, I'll uh, I'll I'll send you the video. It's it's okay. quite a quite a story. Uh, but man, let's let's get to uh, Q and A. Q and A. So first question: Hot or cold? Weather hot. Beach or mountains? Ooh, mountains. Bus or train? Train. Good answer. Cats or dogs? Funny, I have a cat, but I would probably prefer a dog. Well, I hope the cat's not with me. Uh, top or bottom bunk? Oh, shoot. I guess that's tough. In jail, you want the bottom bunk. <laughs> but if you're on a hot train and the window only opens on the top, those India trains. Hmm. That's tough. That's the toughest question you've asked today. It depends where that bunk <laughs> is. Uh, what about yeah, you know, what about middle bunk, right? 
Yeah, man. You in India, the top box was the only one that had the window that opened uh, on the long train, uh, which is like a 20 hour train. So I would definitely pick that one. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's probably the best question I've ever been asked in my life. I don't even know how you came up with that. <sighs> Just. Hey, backpacker talk to me. I'll go with the top bucket. There's, there's, it's such a basic question, but there's so much into it because yeah. I've asked some people, for example, there's there's a recurring guest that always comes on is, is one of my buddies, Sid, and he prefer, he prefers the bottom bunk. But if you'd said that you'd pick, you, you prefer the top bunk is because you like to, it's like the equivalent of being on a waterbed. You know what I mean? If somebody's hooking up with somebody else, on the bottom bunk, it makes yeah. the top bunk kind of go like a waterbed. Yeah, I haven't. I didn't put any of that kind of thought into it like that. I don't think <laughs> I'm doing that on a bunk bed. Uh, but yeah, if I'm sleeping, I don't want to stepping down on my bunk and putting their feet near my face. I'm going at. I'm going at the top bunk for the most part. Hey, good, good call. Favorite sports team? Oh, I'm not into sports. I'm really not into sports. You got a ha- you got a Cardinals hat on. Yeah, I just it's all about colors. Like, uh, I just match my colors with whatever I'm wearing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'd have to go with the Toronto Raptors. It's really the only the only sport I watch. This is all, like, all-encompassing, really busy. Like, there's no time to watch sports. Um, Fair enough. I like, ba- I like boxing. I, wa- I like boxing I would watch. Uh, if you but, had a superpower, what would it be? Man. Tell me, man, these questions, these Q and A's, they sound easy, but they they test you to your core. I'm I'm just warning. Yeah, you. yeah, that's a question I should have an answer to. Wouldn't be flying because I'm scared of heights, so I don't want to fly too too far. I wouldn't want to know the future, man. Maybe you got enough powers as it is. Maybe I, I like just being a normal human being, but I joke even over dinner. I told my my daughter, she has superhuman powers. She always, Dad, you always say that. Um, yeah, man. I don't know. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pass. I don't know. I need more thought. Uh, okay. It's all good. Everybody gets one pass. If you could have a beverage with one person from history, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh, Michael Jackson for sure. Uh, Michael Jackson to me is like probably the first person I idolized. Like not I idolized. I'm not a singer or a dancer. But the first person I looked up to, like on a worldwide level, and like wanted to be like, like I mean, as a as a as a child, uh, and, and his music, it not too often does music break color barriers to the extent that uh, he did. Uh, you know, you you find old people love Michael Jackson, young people. You know, his album Thriller, it's like the the age yeah. group was like from seven years old to seventy was the average consumer of the best-selling record of all time. Um, so I would go with Michael Jackson. That, that doesn't really exist anymore, that demographic for no. an album. No, it, no it, that, that's why he's got the best-selling album of all time, because he broke he, – man, he broke it down. You know, you, you see me some gangsters listening to Michael Jackson, but you also see some people with cowboy hats listening to Michael Jackson, right? So how often does that happen? And to put an album like Thriller together, it's like the perfect – perfect mix of everything i think the only other album i can think that you know caters to seven to 70 is like the space jam soundtrack yeah yeah but not to but i think michael jackson's <laughs> a one, a one off. i'm just kidding I'm he's just yeah kidding. he's the one guy <laughs> man i like the space jam soundtrack i can dude, think of some songs I, put, I put it on the other day it's it's it still holds up dude not as much as thriller i'll, I'll give yeah. you that but it's <laughs> yeah if you look well julio's passed away i know he's on the uh, on the main song, I'm trying to think who else. Oh yeah, there's a bunch of man. I, Barry I White, song. like dude, there's so many. R. R. Kelly, uh, he's on a couple there. Uh, anyways, there like it's it's packed. Anyways, check, check it out. Uh, what's something you never travel without? Now a camera, in a ridiculous amount of batteries. Um, other than that, like if I'm just traveling, I'm a pretty simple traveler. I no doubt I have a long list of things that I bring that people probably um, don't bring. Like I, I always I have a fork spoon, um, you know, this plastic. Like a spork? Because, yeah, always nice. because when I'm ordering something or I'm bringing something to my room and I don't have it, I always bring like a sewing kit. I have black electrical tape. I'm trying to think. I, I bring like this 
medicine container full of, uh, you know, like the, the remedies type thing. Um, mm. I call them, I don't know if I can, I don't want to curse. I call them like uh, when you have to go to the washroom pills. I call them shitting pills. So it says shitting yeah, pills. Yeah, yeah dude, curse. Okay. Those, those kind of things. Um, baby wipes, no doubt. Um, yeah, yeah. Other than that, I'm, I wear like black T-shirts. You know, in hot countries, I really sweat. And with photo, like with video, I like to be able to edit scenes together. People don't get this. So I like to basically look the same every day. I, I bring my yeah, yeah, yeah. T-shirts, right? Because Makes sense. I like to be able to chop. Hey, if this video is not fully enough, let me take something from a previous day and people wouldn't know the difference. But there are some people that hit me up like, Chris, uh, you wear the same thing every day. Yeah, thanks. It's on purpose. So, so, so you're on that Mark Zuckerberg, right? You take one decision out of the day, you just fucking... Yeah, take, take away... Yeah, exactly. I, I've read that story about Mark Zuckerberg and very similar idea, yes. Uh, I just have to ask, not part of my questions, but you made a mention about Top Bunk on the uh, if you're in jail and the sport... Have you been in jail? Yeah, of course. A bunch of times. You've been in jail? In different countries. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Oh, shit. Cool, Cuba, I went to jail uh, for two weeks for flying for a drone. Flying a drone. Yeah. And then as a youngster, like I'm an old man now, but in Toronto, uh, growing up, I was definitely a troublemaker. Uh, I didn't do any long stays in jail, but I've definitely been a few times. Um, Toronto, Good. small stuff like... Uh, not breaking and entering, but being in a, in a in an abandoned establishment like private property, and I got caught doing that a few times in abandoned buildings. I've always had this obsession with, like, I don't even know how that's a criminal charge. Like, it's an abandoned building. I'm in it. I'm not causing any harm. Like, but in Toronto, they looked at it differently. And even till today, I still go in abandoned buildings all the time. I just don't get caught. I guess, and, and I'm ridiculous. I film it and I upload it, but I have been. <laughs> Uh, held in in police custody for going into abandoned buildings, um, but my biggest stay was two, two weeks in Cuba. How was the two weeks in Cuban jail? Yeah, horrible. And, and if you would have told me I was going to be there two weeks, I would do it easily. Uh, but it was the not knowing how long I would be there that that was the scary part. Can you can you describe your experience? Yeah, well, I, I was in like uh, what do they call like productive custody. I'm the one guy that like I'm not allowed outside. Okay, that, that sounds bad because if you're in protective custody in North America, PC, it's like you're a child molester. Uh, you wear a different color jumpsuit and you're hated. It's not the same in Cuba. Cuba, the first two years after you've been arrested, so there's no judge or lawyer or phone call. So the first they have up to two years to do an investigation on you, and during those two years, you're you're locked away from the rest of the people that are in jail. Uh, you don't get any outdoor privileges at all. So I'm in that side of the jail where I'm not allowed to go outside, which was very difficult because I can hear the other guys going outside. You know, they go to the lunchroom, to the cafeteria. I can't do any of that. I was stuck. Uh, but my final few days in jail, they, they started letting me get out in like the general population. Nice. And could, can you speak Spanish? Like, were you able to kind of yeah. converse or? Good enough. And the people that were there, I'm in the tourist jail. Um, so I'm in the non-Cuban jail. So everybody that was okay. there was non-Cuban. So okay. everybody they spoke a bunch of different languages. And I just, a uh, question off, off off the top of my head, not one of my set questions again, but yeah. how many push-ups do you do in jail for two weeks? Yeah, no, I was playing basketball. I was definitely bored. Okay. I had my socks. Yeah. Uh, there was no, like, you don't, you only have running water if it rains. Um, <laughs> you know, like bugs everywhere frogs like there's no windows right so i remember stepping down off my bunk one day and stepping into something there's no lights only the moon like a movie right and my feet were hurting and, and i i went to this the like the moonlight and it was those ants the biting ants and they were all over my leg um really i, I man i would just walk back and forth the room was like a four-person room but it was just me by myself so like for fun i would just like move my bed from the bunk bed to the top then to the other side Every day, you know, I'd sleep a lot, right? What else is there really to do? Um, it's funny. I was doing some push-ups just like the movie. I was skinnier then than I am now. But that was about, I guess, about eight years ago now. Two weeks, man. You must have been jacked coming out of there. Man, I, 
I couldn't wait to get out. It was the first time in my life I went two weeks without shaving. So I had uh, more facial hair. I've never had facial hair in my life. So my kids got to see me in a different a different way. <laughs> you don't get too jacked in two weeks. I was deprived <laughs> of food. I, was, I got a lot skinnier for sure. <laughs> Oh yeah, man. Well, thanks for sharing that. That was, that was, that was interesting. I can laugh about it now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure at the time it wasn't a laughing matter. No, no, not at all. Uh, what is your favorite world attraction? Man, I'm not really an attraction person. Like I like the cultures. I like the people. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if it could be nature as well. Right. Yeah. Man. Like my favorite country in the world is, is Namibia. And the reason oh, yeah. that I, I've fallen in love with Namibia is first and foremost, I wasn't expecting it to be so incredible. Uh, I really went there and it was like a daunting, like, I'm like, oh, when I got out of the airplane, I looked outside, it's all desert. And I'm like, man, I plan to be here 10 days. Like my mind is like, what am I going to do here? Um, but like, what was the attraction? It was, it was, it was the real wildlife. Uh, no, no national park. Like, wildlife just on the street uh in the himba tribe for example uh was man just so magical and and i did it all without like a tour guide or with any i just went um so i don't know if that would be considered an attraction but the tribe i guess the, there are tribes in africa uh no disrespect to them everyone has to eat that are 100 percent money driven money 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 take a picture with the elder okay five dollars it's almost like going to the carnival and, and paying, yeah. you know, pay to play, oh, uh, yeah. which I understand nowadays people have to survive. But I mean, the Himba tribe out of every tribe that I've met was so against money. Never did they ask me for anything. Uh, they treated me as if I were one of them compared to South Sudan. Hey, you want to see our cows? Okay. We need $20. You want to, and nothing against that. I understand people. Have it's just, to, yeah. It, Sours the experience, obviously. Dampers, yeah, dampers the authenticity of it for sure. Which country has the best cuisine? Ooh, I think. And I get asked this all the time, and I'd probably like overall, I would say Italy. Italy is yeah. the food. I like seafood, and they got seafood, and I love pasta. Um, mm. Yeah, but then there are there are some places that were like a real surprise, like Scotland to me was like, wow, Scotland? I never expected food to be so good. Uh, Nepal, incredible. So many different things in Nepal that I've never tried before. Um, so, I mean, it was like it was, it was like a real, every time I could go out to dinner, I'm like, what can I try new? What, what's new and exciting? Um, yeah, I guess those two would be up there. But if you ask me on a different day, then maybe a different uh, place might come to mind. Yeah, solid answers, man. But what's the weirdest food you've eaten? Oh man, I have a list. People, <laughs> people let, let let me just so in South Sudan I ate rat. We caught rat uh, outside and we barbecued them and ate them. <laughs> oh. I've eaten guinea pig in Peru. Yeah, uh, I've done that too. Camel in the Middle East and Africa, camel is everywhere. Camel is very good. So to the average person, if you say camel, uh, they're they're not going to understand these big worms in um, Namibia. They're, they're like grubs that you barbecue up a little bit and, and you eat. Um, yeah, I guess those are a few. I, I'm not into insects. So I, I like when I'm in Asia, I don't eat like bugs yeah. or anything. Oh, I ate a cobra when I was in Vietnam a couple months ago. Nice. Uh, what is your biggest travel pet peeve? I guess people. Um, like big tourist traps and it's not a pet peeve because i like i like it that other people do it i don't want to do it um people so my biggest pet peeve about travel is people that travel to a country let's use dominican republic or mexico or jamaica just as an example and never leave the resort and say to their friends that they hey i went to jamaica no you went to a resort uh you never left the resort you didn't get to experience the culture um and that coincides with people that when they travel, uh, they Google everything and let Google dictate uh, what they're going to do. So, like, for example, if I'm going to a resort 
uh, in Mexico and I'm thinking about leaving the resort, I'm Google like, is it safe for me to leave my resort in Mexico? The first answer says, no, it is not. It is extremely dangerous. So you listen to Google and you stay inside the resort. Uh, and, and I'm not mad at those people. I just don't understand those people. Uh, if you go to a country like statistically, it's also dangerous to stay on a resort in Mexico as well. Yeah, but everywhere, everywhere right. you drink the water, you choke on the chicken bone. Like there's, there's always going to be a reason. Uh, but what I would say is like my biggest pet peeve are those people. And I know yeah, a lot of right. those people and I still like those people, but that aspect of travel, I don't understand. Like get out, go to the local market, uh, go talk to people, you know, ask them questions, try their food, step a little bit outside of your comfort zone to, uh, to enjoy somebody else's culture. Yeah. It's a lot better to get diarrhea from an awesome meal that you had at the market than it is to get from the buffet line. Right? Yeah, for sure. I haven't been to an all inclusive hotel in years, like decades. Um, I, I so much rather go down a, like a little alley and find some little mom and pop restaurant and, and, and eat some food there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. Uh, what is the most underrated country? Namibia. Let me go back to it. My favorite country uh, is something I never hear anybody talk about. It's funny because Drew Binsky, I heard him recently say his favorite country was Namibia. And I'm like, okay, I'm not the only one that sees it. Um, Namibia, Namibia, Namibia. Because uh, like, who do you know that says I want to go to Namibia? I I've, I actually know a bit about Namibia. Like, it's big beer culture because it used to be a German uh, colony, yeah. right? Yes, yes, yes. And there's still German towns there um, with German names. Yeah, my my. I used to live in Germany, and the big thing that I wanted to do is to go do Oktoberfest in Namibia. Amazing. Yeah. It'd be cool. You should. you should. Namibia. Man, even thinking about it and talking about it, it's got me excited. It's been about two years since I've been there. I, I'm going to wait another year and go back. Oh, yeah. You, you, Chris, you travel a lot. Can you tell me your best travel hack? Hmm. Something to help the people that are the, the listeners. Yeah, there's, there's, there's so many, really. There is so many. The basics. Let me, instead of giving you one, the basics, uh, I use hotels.com. So I, I, all my, all my stays other than Airbnb are in one location. Um, so that gives me, because I'm enterprise level, because I stay in more than 30 hotels uh, a year, it gives me the ability to be like their number one, whatever you want to call it. And, and how does that help me? It allows me to check into a hotel any time of day. So if my airplane lands at six in the morning, I don't have to wait till three in the afternoon to check in, or I don't have to pay an additional fee of a day, um, which really helps me. And, and every 10th stay is free. So what I normally okay, do is, cool. I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, I said, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I accumulate my free stays. Uh, and then, you know, normally my last trip of every year, the hotels are all free. Uh, you know, very simple. I use skyscanner.com to book my airplane. And I'm not like a budget traveler, but hey, if I can go on Thursday instead of Tuesday and save $500, I'm going to do that. So Skyscanner yeah, exactly. gives you the ability to look months in advance as to what the price point will be. Um, so I think that's hugely important. Uh, another hack is like certain countries, you got to find out if they require you like a takeaway ticket so for example like belize when you fly to belize they have to see that you're leaving so you yeah. have to show them a ticket that's when you need to have some very basic photoshop skills <laughs> because i only buy one way tickets so here's a trick on any computer if you highlight the date so say your receipt is on your receipt is emailed to you right you can just highlight it right click and go to inspect and change the wording or change the dates so i cannot tell you how many times i've created fake go away tickets uh, because the country will not allow me in without the ticket. And when I go to a country, I don't know how long I'm going to stay. I never, ever, ever have a go away ticket because if I want to leave in two days, I want to leave. If I want to leave in two months, I want to leave. So that little trick about highlighting the words and then inspecting and changing the dates. Um, and then I just take a photo with my, with my phone uh, of the receipt and it, and it works very, very well. Those are three very simple travel hacks for me that i use That's each and every time that i travel that last one it's either like one of the best 
travel hacks I've heard, or possibly one of the worst. It might be no, a, hey, remember when I spent two two weeks in a jail in Belize, right? No, what are they going to do? How are they going to tell? It's <laughs> no, 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 no. That's that's, that's... Yeah, just just make sure their systems aren't digital. You'll be fine. Yeah, no, <laughs> nobody nobody really looks. Believe me, <laughs> Chris. Where's somewhere you'd never go back? This is the tough part. Yeah, there's not, there's not, I don't, look, I went to Kuwait and it was really, really boring. Like everything is very, very quiet and religious and small. There's nothing happening. I went to the beach on a weekend, uh, the biggest beach, and I was the only person there. Even restaurants weren't open in the middle of summer. Oh. So their celebrations are different than my celebrations. And I was so bored. I, I could say I'm not going to, there's no reason for me to ever go back to Kuwait. Um, it reminded you of your two weeks in Cuban jail. Yeah, probably even worse. <laughs> probably even worse. <laughs> Sorry to my Kuwaitis. I was excited to get there, and I'm like, wow, there's nothing happening. I guess if I was with the right person, they would have shown me something better than what I saw. Exactly, but experience sometimes is subjective, right? So you just yeah, didn't have that great of an experience. You you state yeah. your reasons why, and yeah, I have no hate. Like nothing negative happened. It was just really boring. Fair enough. Where did you experience the least? friendly locals somalia mogadishu uh for sure the hatred they had for me for being white and this is the part i don't understand look i'm going to speak very openly i'm a transparent human being when i walk through africa and i've been to about 25 countries in africa i am treated as an equal there are times where people the residents of africa treat me better than equal which i don't expect and i don't want i want to be treated as a human uh, but I'm always treated well. So I went to Mogadishu and I was yelled at. I was rocks were being thrown at me um, and worse, like spat at F you this and that. And, you know, people commented like I uploaded the video, the first video and people commented, well, Chris, you, you should expect it because your people um, have caused so much uh, harm to Mogadishu. And I'm like, this is like the most ridiculous. This is this is a recurring theme I get as a, a white YouTuber that my people have done this. Even with my Haiti series, they're like, your people, your ancestors caused this harm. Uh, it, this this kind of talk can only be towards a white person. I could mm -hmm. never go on any other race's channel and say something like that. See the the harm that's happening in Somalia. And the crime that's happening in Somalia is black on black crime, black on black mm -hmm. killing. Mogadishu has one of the highest murder rates in the world, and not one white human being is anywhere near there. But yet, my people, my ancestors are still to blame. I never felt any hatred in any country anywhere in the world except for Mogadishu. And when I explained how I was feeling, the general public said, it's okay, your people caused this damage. Uh, which I don't understand and I don't agree with, period. It's like saying every Austrian is to blame for Hitler or every Russian is to blame for, like, it doesn't even make any doesn't sense. doesn't make sense. No, I, I agree. I don't I don't I, like it. I don't agree it. And I've never used that kind of nonsense on anyone else. You know, like in Rwanda, there's a genocide. It was black tribe killing black tribe. Imagine a, 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 a black man walks past me on the street and I blame him for Rwanda, it's just pure stupidity. It doesn't even make any sense. Um, so that was the only country, a very long-winded answer as to I was hated the moment I arrived. Yeah, no, that's unfortunate. Where were you the most scared? I think Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. You know, if, if, if I'm in close, like if I'm in an argument with a, uh, somebody on the street in LA and Compton uh, and they don't have a gun to my head, I'm ready to fight. I actually enjoy fighting. Uh, I have a history of fighting. It's something I can do. If they pull a gun out and they say, Chris, or hey, give me your shoes, I give them my shoes. I, most likely I'm going to live. But when you're in, yeah. in war and, and rockets are coming down day and night, there's no opportunity to talk yourself out of it. There's no, I, I just felt for the first time in my life like, hey, if it's my time, it's my time. Uh, because, you know, there, there, there were people uh, dead. Um, I never showed anything on my on my videos. And my videos did extremely poor, um, but I mean, there are people dead that died hundred meters from me, 
and I lived. Hmm. This is uh, this is me from, and my from missiles. Uh, this is me and my bulletproof vest, no helmet, with a guy I met. But like, these are just people walking through the streets with. I don't want to zoom in, but um, yeah, shrapnel that I got to witness and like, and now you have to yeah. ask yourself why, why them and not me? I was a hundred meters away. So the first couple of days, the sound of sirens when the, when the rocket or missile is coming close, definitely had my heart racing to a level it's never raced before, but it might sound crazy to say that I liked it. I don't like death. I like, I want to be very clear. I like that adrenaline rush when, when more, normal people have fear, that adrenaline rush that they get, it makes me feel like I'm alive. I don't want to sound like a psychopath. I don't want, I want to be very clear. Like those people that died, I cry for them. I'm very emotional. But I, I do feed off the adrenaline rush of, you know, a scary environment. Yeah. Let's maybe, um, you know, we touched on some some darker themed things throughout this this question period. Let's let's end with a little bit of a of a happier uh, question. What's the funniest YouTube comment you've gotten recently? Oh man, they're all funny. Every one of them is funny. Man, you got to have thick skin to have to be on YouTube. Uh, and I thought it was just me, uh, but I see everybody gets the same kind of nonsense. The funniest. Quite often, I get I get a question to be either CIA or FBI, undercover. <laughs> he's definitely an undercover. Somebody pointed pointed up yesterday. I have a tattoo of an owl and an all-seeing eye. So I get tattoos from around the world. So this is my Egypt tattoo. I got this in Mexico City. Now, I had no thought or didn't put any idea into this being something to do with I mean, a part of the Illuminati. He's definitely a part of Illuminati. I can tell by his tattoos, the way it's this and that, and it's directional to this and that. Yeah, that kind of stuff is just... See, it's funny now that I can tolerate it, but at the beginning through YouTube, I would have to hit my head on the wall being like, are people this ridiculous? But in reality, it, they are. They are this ridiculous. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's what people say when they're not in front of your face, right? When there's no repercussion. They would never say that. And, and I would say that I've never in my life neg left a negative comment on anybody's page. Like, it just... It's not in me, so I don't understand how people, you know, you know, the comment I get most often is about my glasses. Like, oh, you're like, how do you wear those glasses or your grandmother's glasses or your daughter's glasses? I'm like, man, how does it bother you so much? Because I don't care what you're wearing. It makes no, if I walk down the street and see somebody wearing something I don't like, I don't care. Like, I don't even think about it. But online is a different world because people, feel like they have the obligation to share. It's like they watch the whole video to find something wrong. And it happens like a lot. Like you watched my whole one hour video only to find something wrong that you didn't like. I don't like your glasses. Why would you wear a Cardinals hat if you're in Philadelphia? Uh, you said you're 45. You look like you're 50. Uh, is that really your daughter? Like, are you serious? Like what kind of questions? What kind of questions are these? Like. Man, and they wouldn't say that in person. I get quite no, aggressive. Exactly. If that happened in person, it wouldn't happen. So yeah, it's just you got to have some thick skin in, in the business of YouTube. Yeah, no, that's uh, it's fair enough. It, like you said, it's part of the business, and I think uh, a lot of other YouTubers have come on and and talked about you know, especially your boy Seal. Like we we talked about that quite a bit, and uh, yeah, sometimes you just have to. Yes, I think it's it's a good attitude to have to laugh laugh yeah, about it. You know what I mean? I see. I see recently he's posting up like some of the negative comments. I do it sometimes too. Uh, I think it's funny, but I don't know if it motivates people to leave stupider comments next time. So I don't know if it's beneficial in showcasing the stupid comments. Everybody wants to be the stupidest nowadays. We're they, weird. They do, we're but scary. if you, if you like, for example, I think he, he takes the ones that are um, like the ones that the messages he gets from people. And then he posts the profile like, hey, this person said this. Yeah, I think they don't want to be associated with that, especially on Instagram. Maybe YouTube's a different culture, but yeah. I don't think yeah. people want to be seen. I don't. I don't think they care. I really don't. Think, I don't think they care. I really don't think they care. There's no thought put in. They leave the comment. They don't care. 
Uh, Chris, let's uh, get into the story. Story time. So, I was in Haiti uh, for a week, about a year ago. And the reason I had gone, I'm sitting uh, on my living room couch with my wife and we're watching the news, which we really don't watch too often. Uh, and the, the highlight or headline that came on was like, Haiti is in a gang war, like crisis. Uh, the president was just killed. So I'm watching it with my wife and I look to my wife and she's like, let me guess, you want to go? And I'm like, yeah, love. Like this is. I wanted to go to Haiti. Let me go now. She's like, oh, be safe. So the next day, I'm on a flight. I actually, uh, I could only find one tour guide per se uh, online. So when he picked me up at the airport, prior to that, I didn't tell him what my intentions were. So when he picked me up at the airport, his name is Sean, uh, and he came with some itinerary, a paper with like, okay, we're gonna go to the museum. We're gonna go to this statue, this statue. And I looked at him like, Sean, I don't want to do any of that. I want to do, I want to go into the gang territory. He looked at me, he's like, he's like, I've been waiting for a tourist like you. So his job is he's a fixer, you know, a fixer is for the media, like the CNN will say, Hey, I want to interview with a gang leader and he'll set it up. And then they go do the, the meeting and he gets paid for fixing, for fixing the situation. Um, so when I, I came there, not CNN by myself saying, I want to go into gang territory. You got excited. He threw away this little white paper itinerary. And right away, before we even brought my suitcase to the hotel, we went to gang territory and, and went in. So on this specific occasion, we're in City of Sule, City of Sun, and it is known as Haiti's worst slum. And I think it's the poorest place on Earth, like planet Earth. Um, up, the way it's situated is like, it's pretty big community, uh, but it, every side of it is a different gang. In every side, every gang is at war with each other. So the people of the city cannot leave. Okay, and as close as they are to the water, like the ocean, they cannot touch the water or they'll be shot at and killed. So they're living in this make-believe bubble. There's no physical bubble. They can't work. There's no vegetation. There's no good soil. And often the water raises and their garden is very small. There's no food. There's no. There's no animals. There's no. There's nothing. There's no hope. There's no clean water. There's nothing. And if they try to leave, they'll be killed instantly because there's one street out, and you'll have to pass by a gang checkpoint, which you see in my video. I have money or shoes to give to the checkpoint. They don't have it. They'll be killed. Mm -hmm. So I'm going in where everybody wants to come out. I'm the one going in to the territory. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is sit down with the leader, the gang leader of the one person that's in charge of this community today. We're sitting in this little tiny room, uh, three of them and myself and my translator slash guide, Sean. And he's like, how much money do you, are you going to offer us to enter like my area? And I, I brought 50, I had 50 US dollars on me. I never leave my hotel with a lot of money because I know, <laughs> I think it's been like great. They're going to think I'm rich and, I, I might, you know, become a target of kidnap or or worse. Yeah. So, I, I slide. I always have extra money in my pocket. My uh, my left sock is always my backup money, but in my pocket, I always have fifty to a hundred dollars. So I said, "Look, I don't want to insult you, sir. I'm going to give you fifty dollars. Please let me enter, and I'd also like like an escort, like not a not a girl escort, like an escort through the community, like somebody to bring yeah, me yeah. around. Make sure, I'm okay." Um, He's like, you're crazy. And he's telling through the translator and they're all laughing at me in there. And I'm like, oh, sh they're laughing. Is this a good laugh? So I start laughing too. And I'm telling my translator, tell them I'm crazy. And I start getting loud. So they think like there's something, I'm not normal. So he brings out his phone and he showed me a video. And the video is a man in a suit. And I remember vividly and he's walking this man in the suit through the hills. And I'm presuming it's somewhere where I am, like somewhere in the neighborhood. And the guy is like turning back and they're talking. And then the guy turns around and goes like this and he has a suit on. And then about, I don't know, four to six of them come with machetes and just start with his hand, cutting his hands off, his arms off, elbow, legs. And he's twitching and he's blood squirting everywhere. Everyone in the little room that I'm at is laughing. So I have to laugh immediately. And inside, I'm crying. I'm like, what the hell? Inside is happening like at the same time. Like, what are you doing, Chris? So they turn and they ask me, like, what do you think about this? 
So I questioned him, like, did he did he deserve to die? What did he do? And they're like, well, maybe he maybe he talked to the enemy, maybe. Like, we don't know, but we think. And I said, well, why why did he wear a suit? Like, he's like, well, we told him we we're going to kill him. Wear your best suit. And I'm like, why didn't he run? And they said, well, we told him if you run, we're going to kill your kids, your kid's teacher, uh, the schoolmates, the neighbors, your mom, your father. So he was smart. He came and met us, and he knew he was going to die. Um, so I had to laugh, and it was it's horrible. But to get to survive, I have to pretend to be somewhat like one of them. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. I'm like, I'm in the perfect spot because I'm crazy too. Uh, and they opened up the door, and they let me through the community, which is the video I'm going to show tonight. Um, and they had people around me to protect me in case other gangs came after me. And all of that for 50 Fifty dollars U.S., but it was that point. It's a pivotal point because if that guy was in a bad mood, he could have killed me in that little spot. Nobody would have known. He could have kidnapped me for more money. Uh, but I was able to sort of talk my way out of it. And you know what? There, there. Were, this story actually happens more. I can think of a few times that similar things have happened with guns and guns being held to me that you don't see in the videos. This is even since I started YouTube. And you're watching the video and you have no idea what I went through uh, in order to get that video or to get to that place. So in today's video, there's a little part where I stop and explain that story just like I did now. Um, so you understand like getting into these neighborhoods. I, I put that out there because I don't want people to go there. I don't want people to try to follow in my footsteps. If something happened, I would feel, I would feel bad for it. But that being said, you know, I went there. Uh, Indigo Traveler saw the video and he messaged me and he's like, can I do the same thing? And I said, here's the information. Then Binsky took it from Indigo Traveler, did the same video. I was the first one in there to do it. Nobody had ever, ever recorded it. Now, those guys are much bigger than me uh, on YouTube and I respect their hustle. Uh, but they have I, I was the one that paved the way into that community. Um, they, they just followed in my footsteps. Oh. Man, you were telling that story. I got chills. You know what was crazier? They actually gave me the video um, of them doing it. They're like as a souvenir. Um, and over time, it's only been a year. I just deleted it. I didn't want it. felt like I was being, my phone was like possessed with negativity. I don't get enjoyment out of watching that kind of stuff. I don't like it. I don't want it near me. <clears throat> it just shows how brazen. Because I have videos in Haiti where they're like, Chris, you don't blur the faces of the gangsters. The gangsters don't care. This is not, it's a different world. Oh, you show where they're located. They know where the enemy is located. They're shooting at each other every day. So you know, it's not like Pablo Escobar where the U.S. went to go find him. These are gangs that do not drive cars. They don't move. They were born. They know who their enemy is. They know where the enemy is located. They shoot. It's like Bloods and Crips. You know your blood, your crypt, your enemy. Like no, nobody needed their blur. And I ask all the people, like, you want me to blur the face? They're like, no, no, don't be ridiculous. So that's one of the stories that comes to mind when it's like something that was like a touchy could have gone either way. Fuck, dude, that was heavy. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's next level. That, that that was recent, right? Was that like that uh, new leader barbecue guy or whatever? No, no, it was one of the oppositions to him. There are a lot of gangs there. I had the opportunity to talk to him. He wanted 5,000 US dollars, which I was going to pay because uh, it would be a good investment for me and my channel. But he wanted me to wait yeah. around two weeks. And I was really worried. You know, when I'm meeting gangsters, I never pre plan it. I don't want them to think ahead of time like what they want to do. I don't want them conversing like, hey, what? You know, when I meet these gangsters, I just pull up on them. I've never talked to them before. I want to go in and out, and I don't return. You know, sometimes they'll be like, hey, come back next week. I'm not coming back next week. I tell them yes, but I'm not coming back next week. So when Barbecue said over the phone, like, I'll do it for 5000 but you have to wait two weeks, and I had already been there a week, I'm like, no, I'm pushing my my luck. So, Dude, so I, I, I think I think I figured something out. Those guys that you're saying that you're coming back and you're not actually coming back, those are the guys who are putting the negative comments on your on your videos, dude. <laughs> We're calling everybody around the world and – <laughs> but I get the positive far outweighs the negative. I don't want to be a negative person, but some of these comments are just ridiculous. I, today, 
I put up that I was in South Africa and they called a chicken. Um, oh my God. A road runner in the restaurant. They're like, Oh, they call this road runner. Somebody commented. No, they don't. I'm from Africa. They don't call that road runner. And I'm like, it's on the menu in the restaurant I'm at, but you still know better. Like, like people are, are, there's something wrong. A lot of people have some issues up there. It's the know-it-all syndrome where people just need to be heard. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, man, Chris, this was great. Thank you so much for coming on. Before I leave you here, uh, are you able to remind people where they can find you? Sure. Chris must list uh, on YouTube. And I guess uh, the same, the same name on any social media, you can find me Uh, for like personal message. You want to send me a message. Instagram would be probably the best. Uh, But other than that, YouTube. And and lastly, I'm, I'm starting a new, channel as of yesterday called Chris Must Academy. Uh, you know, I've grown this channel of mine to 260,000 uh, subscribers in the last three years. I'm hyper addictive to this whole YouTube thing. So when I'm not filming, I am studying every day, hour after hour, like reverse engineering success to try to figure out uh, what works and what doesn't work from thumbnails to titles to content. So I'm starting a new channel where I'm going to share tips on how to help grow your YouTube channel. So it's Chris Must Academy on YouTube. Awesome. And basically that is that. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much for coming on. And I actually want to talk a bit more about that if we could just after this here. So thanks. So thank you so much for coming on. We'll catch you next time, dude. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Two Beers Till Takeoff. Do you want free additional content or just to stay connected with the show? Then give us a follow on our social media platform. That means TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of them. Are you in need of podcast production services, video editing, or anything in between? Then look no further than Strut Sound Productions, the official producer of the Two Beers Till Takeoff podcast. Music produced by Alex Gagne. Check out his work in our show notes. Voiceover done by Viking Leo K. See you next week on Two Beers Till Takeoff. Thank you.